You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining me for another episode of Hackernet After Dark. Thanks. It means a lot. You're swell. Um, today on the show, we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna answer some phone calls. <laughs> I think I used that joke already. But when you got a gem, you can't just use it once, man. Pull that one out of your back pocket. The people love it. They really do. But let's kick this thing off with Johnny from Phoenix. Hey, man. This is your old buddy, John, from uh, Phoenix. Hey, man. Yada, yada. Um, There's nothing I can say about yesterday's game. Uh, I got tired of watching the pocket collapse every single down. And yep. AJ and Aaron uh, Jones just... I, I don't know. It, there just wasn't any cohesion there on the on the offense at all. Uh, special teams, not so good. Defense, flashes of greatness. But I watched a lot of football yesterday and watched <laughs> the the Cowboys play. They were they were good against the the Eagles until they weren't. Um, watched uh, Arizona play. They were decent against uh, Seattle. And Seattle was decent. Uh, and we just, and I don't even want to talk about KC and Buffalo. Uh, we have no chance against any of those teams. I got it. And I did not listen to Monday's podcast about uh, Lafleur. However, I got enough from uh, Sunday's uh, uh, Packer Net After Dark uh, to uh, uh, come to the conclusion that they, yeah, maybe we need to get rid of somebody and promote Rich Basaccia to a head coach. Happened last year in Las Vegas. It went really well for Las Vegas. Everybody was shocked that Basaccia wasn't made head coach for this year. We got him, and he did turn special teams around. I think that may be the answer. Head coach Rich Basaccia, Green Bay Packers. Go Pack Go. Yeah, I mean... I, I I'll say I never really entertained that necessarily too seriously as far as making him the new head coach. Um, that was always just kind of a, a goofy thing from my perspective, although it, it may work. I don't know. But um, the one thing that that I thought was a possibility maybe would be making him assistant head coach. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought that that's kind of silly. Um, you know, the the thing in Las Vegas was organic. It was real. It, it was it was a bad situation, a traumatic situation. I mean, you had, you had players taking mental health time off because of some of the comments that their head coach, the guy that they believed in, were fighting for, were saying, and were not in a good headspace. And Rich came in, and you know, the, there's a real thing that takes place there, where it's like, you know, I, things are bad, and. Um, our backs are against the wall and, and nobody likes us and nobody believes in us. And I, I, you know, I'm just asking you to believe in me and I'm asking you to, to, to go out there and fight and I'm going to do everything I can for you if you'll do everything you can for me. You know, I mean, it's, it's a real thing. And they, they believed in that real thing, that, that emotional thing that was taking place. If we do that here, it's fake. It's all fake. It's we're going to bring in Rich and, and like, hey, do that thing where you like motivate people, you know? And it's, it, it's, it's so unbelievably cheesy like hey guys come here come here this is rich Pisaccia. you guys know him as as formerly as the special teams coach he is now going to be the grand master motivator he's here to get you fired up 
All right, guys, watch this. Rich, do the do the do the thing you do you, with the, the motivating so that they love you and want to fight for you. Well, that's not really how it works. No, no, no. Just just do the do the thing. Do the thing you do. Okay. You know what I mean? It's it's not real. It's not organic. And it's not to say that maybe they wouldn't still fight for him more so, but it's it's phony. And and the fact that he's been given that title for that purpose makes it even more weird. You know, it's kind of like when somebody asks you to do a thing, it's always more awkward. You know, they, they didn't ask Rich Bisacci to go motivate the team. He was able to motivate them because of the way he handled a situation. If you hand somebody the title of, hey, we need you to motivate the team because our head coach can't, it's, it's weird and it's not going to work. It's not going to have the same effect. It, it, it had a lot to do. I mean, Rich Bisacci was the right guy to say the right things and do the right things in that situation, but the situation we're missing. I understand we're losing, but let's not be so dramatic. We're in a situation too. No, it's a different situation. This is a, you guys suck and you don't care and you got an attitude problem and you need to stop sucking, please. I'm sure Rich could say that, but it's it's a different situation and we'll leave it at that. Um, I forgot what you had said in the beginning, but it got me wanting to look at something. Oh, just about being generally a bad team and whatnot, and, and you know, we, we can't compete and all that. And I thought it would be a good opportunity, because I haven't done it yet, to kind of re-look at what we did a couple weeks ago. You know, when things were not great, I think after we beat Washington or uh, New England, I looked at it and said, you know, we're not doing great. I looked at our point differential, and I said, okay, here are some teams that have won, who at that point in the season were this far. And there were several teams who had won Super Bowls, um, had good seasons, et cetera, et cetera. Let's do this and find out if that's still the case. Point differential. The Packers right now rank 20th at minus 16. I can't remember the last time we were... That's another thing I want to look at. Last time we were minus 16 or worse, or even minus at this point in the season. So I got some good news for you. In the entirety of NFL history, never has a team had a point differential like we have that has won the Super Bowl through six weeks. Ever. Only twice... Has a team had a negative point differential through week six and won the Super Bowl? Oakland did it twice. 1976, they um, they were actually five and one with a negative seven point differential. In 1976, they won the Super Bowl. In 1980, Oakland again had uh, they were a three and three team with a minus seven point differential. So you got to go back to 1980 to find a team that's even close. Again, remember we're minus 16 right now. So it's you know. We, we can't even play these stupid little games that we've been playing where it's like, you know, we've seen adversity before. Teams have, have had these pro You know, we've seen plenty of teams start off slow and go on to win the Super Bowl. No, no, we haven't. We haven't. The third lowest point differential is a positive 7. After that is a positive 13. The worst record ever to win a Super Bowl was 3-3. Three and three. And yes, one of those teams was the, the um, 2010 Green Bay Packers. That is true, but we had a positive point differential of 27 points. We are, again, at minus 16. Since 1992, we're talking since the, the dawn of the Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers era. This is the fourth worst start in Green Bay Packers history. The worst was 1992, Brett Favre's official first uh, start. We had a negative 41 point differential. 2006, which was sort of the end of the Brett Favre era, negative 41. Actually, that's not even true. One of, one of them is 1991. So that's it. 1992 and 2006 are the only seasons we've had a worse start than this. After that was 2004 at minus 15. After that is 2018. We had a positive four point differential. Think about that. 2018, how bad we were? Positive four. We were three, two, and one with a positive four point differential. We're currently at negative 16. This is the worst start to a season that we've seen since 2006 prior to that was 1992 and again zero Super Bowls for teams that look like us there have been however 28 teams to make the playoffs um, in NFL history with this bad of a start one of those teams being the 2020 Cleveland Browns as well as the 2020 Washington whatever their name was at the time Washington football team was 7-9 and nine and snuck into the playoffs, got obliterated by Tampa. 2020 Cleveland Browns actually had a good record. They were 11-5. and five. They just, uh, well, they didn't even get off to a slow start. They, they, they were 4-2. Uh, and two. 
but they just got annihilated when they lost. 38-7 to and 38-6. to Continued winning throughout the season. Beat Pittsburgh in the playoffs and then lost narrowly to the Kansas City Chiefs. Anyways, we don't need to spend too much time on that, but there you go. There's some information for you. Nothing you wanted to hear, but I mean, what did you expect? It is funny, though, because I feel so weird saying that this is like 2018 because that feels so wrong. Like, oh, come on, you're being ridiculous. It's not that bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not 2018. It's actually worse. It's actually worse. We were a better football team in 2018, so that's great. Yeah, man. So uh, on the uh, on the more important uh, aspect of uh, food, because yeah. I heard you begging for talks about food. Well, uh, uh, one thing I have not had in forever, it feels bacon. like, is uh, some good cabeza, some good uh, some good tacos. And uh, Monday night, October seventeenth, I will be going for uh, cabeza for uh, for dinner tonight. Wow! Big pile of cabeza and rice and beans and all that stuff that you don't like, but I do. Um, some corn tortillas, and I'm going to be shoveling them in my face while I watch Russell Wilson yet again on primetime Monday Night Football. I'm sick of that guy, but <laughs> that's a whole other story. Uh, but Cabeza or Berea, I haven't decided yet, um, but definitely uh, Mexican food tonight. All right, man. Go Pack Go. I've never had either of those. Um, Berea tacos are number one on my list of things that I want to eat. And I don't know why I just sit here and keep talking about it and don't just go get the stuff to try to make it and just do it and dedicate an entire day to making birria tacos. Uh, Cabeza, I I hear it's good. It's one of those things where I'd love to go to a place, whether it be you know Mexico or California or just somewhere in the Southwest, I guess that that has just you know some real good street tacos or something. And I want somebody to just give me the taco and don't tell me what it is. You know what I mean? I don't want to know that it's cabeza, that it's the head of the animal. I don't want to know that. I don't want to know it's head meat. The one I don't want is they've got, like, organs, and they've got, I think some cook up, like, reproductive organs and stuff. I don't, I, I, I'm i fine, dude. There, there's a lot of options. You can put a lot of stuff in a taco. And I've I've pretty much any kind of meat that you can find at a supermarket, I've put it in there. Meatballs, chicken nuggets. Chicken fries, pretty much the same thing, different shape, slightly different seasoning. Um, shredded chicken, frozen chicken, like the, the frozen chicken cubes and stuff, those are pretty good. Ground beef, steak. My grandma will make like this beef and gravy for like the holidays. That is some of the best tacos ever. This this beef and gravy stuff, and then you throw that on a taco shell with some cheese and stuff the next day and some hot sauce. Dang. You know what else is good? I make uh, meatball tacos, but throw in some marinara sauce. Meatball, marinara, cheese, kind of like a meatball sub, but then also dash a little hot sauce in there. Dang. Not sure if I've had a turkey taco, but probably. So, point is, there's a lot of options out there. I don't I don't think I need organs, you know? But, um, I don't know, cabeza might be good. I, again, I just don't want to know. Just don't tell me. Just be like, here's a really good taco, try this one. Be like, alright, and I'll devour it and think it's good, and then we'll move on with our life. Just don't ever tell me. Maybe after I've had like 17 of them. You know, not like in a sitting. I'm just saying like over time, like, oh yeah, give me that, give me that one that's real good that doesn't have a name that nobody wants to talk about. And then once I'm like fully entrenched and probably have halfway an idea that it might be that, maybe you can kind of let me know. But then there's still that, that fear that now I'm going to start tasting something. Not that I know what head meat tastes like, but I'm just, there's going to be like a little flavor in there all of a sudden be like, eh, that tastes like a head. I'm not eating that. That happened once with this this chicken dish my grandma made that had Swiss cheese on it. I hate Swiss. It's disgusting. I didn't know there was Swiss cheese on it. It was the most delicious thing in the world. It's like chicken, Swiss cheese, croutons, whatever. So good. Found out it was Swiss cheese. Suddenly I can taste Swiss cheese. Suddenly I don't like it anymore. It's one of my favorite dishes. Didn't like it anymore. Forced myself to keep eating it until I stopped noticing the taste. Oh, you know what else it happened for? Squirt. Love squirt. One of my favorite things in the world. Come to find out. Dude, do not Google squirt, by the way. Good Lord. Google squirt drink. Jeez, you people are weird. But anyways, it's grapefruit. I don't like grapefruit. And as soon as I, I, I bought a squirt and it said grapefruit soda, and I'm like, this is not grapefruit. I don't even like grapefruit. I drank it. I'm like, dude, this is grapefruit juice. This is disgusting. Ruined it for me. So don't tell, just never tell me. Never tell me what it is, and I'll, it will be fine. Hey, what's going on? It's Omar Firefighter again. Uh, I never call back this many times in a week, um, but being out at the station, 
working the last two times and I couldn't really finish what I wanted to say. Uh, I heard the last uh, Packers Out the Dog podcast and I wanted to say this. This was very funny when you was talking about the zombie apocalypse <laughs> and you said the players that you wanted with you because y'all all were going to die <laughs> were all the players that pay like trash. I, I busted out laughing. So thank you for that stress relief. That was funny. That was very funny. So anybody who thinks that was funny don't have a sense of humor because that was all awesome because I know you missed it. Uh, second thing is you just now I just figured out why everybody's leaving my Patreon. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, maybe it's the economy. I was like, oh no, it's probably that 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 was that was the joke that everyone that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm done with this guy. This I know. Uh, I kind of agree with you. Like Lafleur, you know, he they're not playing hard for him right now. But he just got a contract extension, so I mean, I I would you know give him like two more years, which is a lot. But it's like I'll give you another year with Aaron. I don't think Aaron's gonna retire. Um, I'll give you another year with Aaron, and then see how that goes. And if it goes this bad again, then we fire you. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe I went too hard in on it because it's it's it was kind of a revelation. And when something's a revelation, it's like a big deal for me, and I I want to like really lay it out there and lay out the case for it. And it probably sounded like I was going in real heavy for we got to fire this guy. At least that's the impression it seems like a lot of people got, and that's not what I was trying to say. Um, I, I just, again, I five seconds ago, I thought Matt LaFleur was the greatest coach in the NFL, and he never got any credit for it, and everyone's an idiot and biased and stupid, and I hate them. And me and Matt LaFleur are going to ride off into the sunset together, best friends or something. I don't know, something about 13 wins. But, you know, again, and, and, and people still want to keep going in about how stupid this is. You can call it whatever you want. And you can sit there and talk about his 13 wins and everything else. But again, answer this question. When the team is, the, I'm, I'm not talking about a player, the entire team in all phases, all of your stars are underperforming, unprepared, playing with no heart no passion, no discipline, nobody knows what they're doing. Whose fault is that? And it is a trick question. We all know the answer to the question. It's the coach, the head coach. And no matter what you say, it ultimately always comes back to the head coach. Well, maybe it's the position coaches. That's still on the head coach. First of all, they're his hires. Second of all, it's still his responsibility. All they're really doing is delegating, right? It's, it's, Matt LaFleur has way too much. He can't be with everybody, every position group, every single thing. So he has larger groups. You got your offensive coordinator, you got your defensive coordinator, you got your special teams coordinator, and then they filter down to the whatever. But it's still Matt who's at the top. Well, Aaron Rodgers is causing problems. I'm sorry. That, first of all, I don't buy it. You know, the reason special teams, uh, McDuffie can't block on special teams is because Aaron Rodgers has an attitude. That's a weak theory, but even so, we're still talking about player buy-in. I don't think the players do buy-in. That's a head coach thing. So all it really was for me is the revelation that instead of this guy's locked up for sure, and I hope he's here for all all eternity, he may be on the hot seat, which just means he is now in a situation where it's becoming clear that he's the problem. The play calling is great. It's elite. It's awesome. But we can't win. If the players aren't ready, if they're not prepared, if they're not disciplined, and if they don't buy in, we cannot win with this system, with this with this setup. That's the reality today. Meaning that pending a change, there has to be a change in the future. Has to be. And it's just a matter of how long are we going to wait? And it's going to I agree with you, it's going to be too long. We're not going to let them go this year, probably not even next year. But you know what's going to happen? It's going to be three years and everybody's going to say it took too long. Nobody's saying that now because this is a brand new thing. And and again, I know how this sounds. Two losses, and suddenly you want to fire Matt LaFleur, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I'm just not stuck in my ways, all right? I'm not stuck with it. I've been saying Matt LaFleur is this, that, and the other thing for for years now. But I have new information in front of me, and I don't know what else to do with this information. He either turns it around, changes it, gets this team back on track, and I don't know if he necessarily can change everything, but what he can do is find a way for this team to start winning, and the rest of that stuff will take care of itself. You don't have to learn how to fight through adversity if there's no more adversity, if you're winning. So go find a way to win. If you can't drag people through that, just go around it. But again, I'm not saying he gets fired this year or or at any point in time. I know they've invested in him. I know they really like him, and they should. There's, there's a ton to like. But the problem is, it's a very similar situation to Aaron Rodgers. He's great, 
most of the time. But there's this one area, two areas, three areas, where he is terrible. And those areas are really shining through and are costing us games. Literally the exact same thing you could apply to Matt LaFleur. He is phenomenal in 90% of what he does. But there's a 10% that he sucks at that we really need right now that he doesn't have that we can't bring forward and it's costing us games. So what do we do? What do you do about that? You try to just go around it all the time and just make sure we have an elite team that's playing at a high level and never loses and then we don't have any problems? Now, we don't have to answer the question right now because, again, like most of the things we're talking about, making a change at quarterback, promoting Bisaccia, firing Matt LaFleur, um, you know, offensive line change you can do, but all the drastic stuff we're talking about is, is, if at all, way down the line, so we don't have to worry about it. But I do want to put a pin in it and say this is a very real thing, and I'm staking this date right now is the date that I said something changed and something is becoming very real here. And if that thing doesn't change, I don't see any alternative other than Matt can't stay. That's all. We're just, we're just marking this date and time as, as we're starting the clock. And maybe that clock runs for a couple of years, I don't know. But it did start. Because we should have a top 15 pick um, based on how we play, probably like 12 or something like that. Um, that's, a, that's another good question. I'm sorry I keep interrupting. I wonder if there's a way for me to check. There is. Uh, let me look at something here. How do teams usually pan out that are in our position? We've already said, do they win Super Bowls? The answer is no. When's the last time we saw this? It was 2006. Prior to that was 1992. But in recent history, what teams are in our position and where do they usually end up? So there have been seven teams in NFL history with a negative 16-point differential that are 3-3. Three and three. 2022 Green Bay Packers. Uh, most recently, 2013 Arizona Cardinals. That team did go 10-6 and six and somehow still missed the playoffs. That's slightly encouraging, I suppose. They had the 16th ranked offense and the 7th ranked defense. I could see this being like a real thing, as weird as that is. The 2007 Cleveland Browns also ended 10-6. The 1997 Giants, 10-5-1. Something tells me we're going to win 10 games this year. The 1984 Tampa Bay Buccaneers were 6-10, still a 10. 1978 Seahawks, 9-7. And then the 1974 Green Bay Packers under Dan Devine were 6 and 8. There you go. There's the general track record. I think the only team that made the playoffs was the 97 Giants, and they lost in the first round to the Vikings. Sorry, am I bringing everybody down? Sorry about that. Because like you said, we're too talented to like lose too many games. Um, Side note to go on something a little more positive. I remember I mentioned this to you way back when I first called was did you watch the show The Boys? Oh boy. Again, to repeat the concept, it's a comedy action superhero show. And it's I promise you, just all I all I'm asking all you right. is just to give it all right. three episodes. All right. That's all you need to do. And if you don't like it, you'll need to watch it. But I promise you, you will love it. Especially because you're down, you need to laugh. And it's like <laughs> funny, like dark comedy, you know. Um, it's hilarious, and I'm, I guarantee you, anybody who listened and watched the show, love it. And all the people who are sad that we're not like doing a great job, watch the show. Like you know, everybody deserves a laugh, and I promise you, just give it three episodes. The first episode is real slow, and then at the end you're like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and then the second episode you find out what's going on, and third episode you're like, it's my favorite show. So just, right. just do that for everybody, all fellow Packers fans. Um. Start looking for wide receivers in the draft. I know that's not the only problem, but we look, you know, it's kind of hard to scout offensive linemen. So yeah. just as far as watching college games, let's try to get a, a good, hopefully get number one wide receiver, picking in the top 15. We should be able to. Um, and, you know, get a good tackle in the second round. It's sad I'm already worried about the draft, but we're just being realistic here. Um, anyway, I do appreciate the positive callers because – it gives me something else to say. Maybe I can look at it this way, but it's it's real difficult. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm trying to pull up some college stuff to look at here, but my uh, computer is being real stupid. Got too much going on right now, and I don't feel like closing any tabs. Plus, I got to keep the boys tab. I always do that. I put it up there because I'm like, I don't want to forget. And then I get, I'm a psycho about tabs. Like I, right now, I'm freaking out because I have a bunch of Twitter tabs open because I want to use the content. Um, I should just bookmark it, but I'm not doing that for some stupid reason. 
And so I have a bunch of Twitter tabs open and everything else right now. So it's a little, a little slow. But anyways, uh, you know, highest graded receivers. College is always tough because there's a lot of smaller school guys. So uh, Jameer Roberts out of UMass with one target is is there. So the one target disqualifies him. But also you got smaller school guys. Uh, if you get rid of the low targets, Tease Johnson out of Troy. But it's a safe bet to disregard small schools and look at the bigger schools. Marvin Harrison is ranked third out of Ohio State. I've seen a ton of highlights about him. Uh, maybe Trey Palmer in Nebraska. I don't really know. Um, obviously, Ohio State has two in the uh, in the top ten. Uh, Amika Ogbuka. I don't know. Actually, Chamiri DK. I think that's how you say his name. Is ranked twenty uh, second out of Wisconsin. It's actually a friend of my cousin's. It's kind of funny. We were rooting for him as a family just because you know they knew him and whatnot. But he's kind of like a smaller end. I didn't think he'd ever like become. First of all, he's a Wisconsin wide receiver, and Wisconsin wide receivers never materialize into anything. But also, he was like the number three or four or something on the team in the past. So it's just kind of a cool thing. Like, oh, yeah, it's a family friend or whatever. He's doing pretty well. But one of the fun things that you can actually do that I should probably spend more time doing is looking at specifics. What do we want in a wide receiver? Clearly, the Packers would like a deep threat, but I think we've already, I don't want to say solved that issue, but addressed that issue. And so if they did get another wide receiver, and I don't know if they will, it's probably going to find, as much as it'll upset people, a Dobbs replacement, which is probably why they're not actually going to be investing in a wide receiver as much as everybody would want them to. Because Dobbs is sort of that Devontae Adams type. And on the other end, you have Christian Watson, who is your replacement MVS. And you probably still have Lazard. I'm guessing he'll stick around. But even if he doesn't, Lazard is this year's Devontae. Next year is going to be Dobbs' Devontae. And then if you have another guy that's in the slot, it's going to be Amari. Again, nobody likes what I'm saying right now. <laughs> no, we need a... Okay. But just understand, this is generally how the Packers operate. We, we just categorize it as wide receiver. We need a better wide receiver. Go get a better wide receiver. All right, well, are we going to get a better Dobbs, a better Christian Watson, or a better Amari? The question being, who are we going to abandon and give up on? And it doesn't necessarily have to be that dramatic. We kind of rotate guys in and out, but I'm just saying... That's the thing. But between this and SIS, you can kind of delve into, you know, depth, for example. But the the first thing is identifying what specifically we need, rather than just saying wide receiver. There are currently eight, by the way, that have 99.9 overall grades on uh, deep throws. So if you want to go that route, you got some options. If you want somebody that can be man or zone, highest receiving grade in man coverage is Josh Downs out of North Carolina. 13 of 13, 152 yards, four touchdowns. So stuff like that. But again, got to start asking those questions, what exactly it is that we're looking for. Also looking at the fact like Marvin Harrison is going to be long gone before we end up drafting, although I shouldn't say that. You know what I wanted to look at that I that I completely forgot? I got hung up on um, looking at these seven teams. I guess that we did look at their records, but I wanted to kind of estimate where we'd be drafting. And honestly, nine-ish wins kind of seems legit which, again, is not um, a top-10 pick. Hey, Ryan. This is Garrett from Southern Illinois. Hey. Uh, first time calling since I uh, went on vacation. Uh, I left to go to the Ozarks uh, hey. right after the London game and seemed to play out almost like what I thought would happen, and that was the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde raised their ugly heads in this game where one half they look great and the second half they look absolutely horrible. Um, moving into Sunday's game against the Jets, uh, I was driving back from the Ozarks, so I didn't get to see that game at all. But uh, after watching a little bit of it on my phone, um, all I could see was just how in every phase of the game, blocking uh, just seemed to, again, be their weak point yep. on the offensive line, uh, on special teams especially. It's amazing how the Jets almost identically played the same kind of game against uh, Green Bay in this game where it was 3-3 at the half where we probably left points on the on the board that we could have had uh, with missed opportunities. And then special teams just gives it right back to them and just takes all the air out of out of our team. I thought the defense played, again, inconsistently, uh, but we've had moments where it's like, man, I wish that was just how you would do it every play, but uh, it just doesn't seem to be able to pull it together. 
That uh, seems to be the most of what I can say since I didn't get to really watch the game. But uh, blocking, inconsistency, and just underutilizing some things that uh, I just don't understand the schemes. I know that you and Clayton do a really good job explaining it, but uh, I'm just not wrapping my head around how Aaron Jones only touches the ball, ball four times in the first half. So, all right, Ryan, have a good one. Yeah, that would be something that's kind of interesting to look at in terms of, you know, when they didn't run, how often should they have? All right, because we, we can assume, for example, second and 10 going into a really good run defense is suboptimal. I know a lot of people, well, you should do it anyways. Well, just just so we're clear, that's one situation. Also, third and long, another situation you probably don't want to do that. So how many times could you clearly look and say, this would be a time when I'd want you to run, but you didn't run? I'm just saying it would be interesting to look at. I'm not, I don't know the answer. But um, yeah, I, I think the offensive line is pretty clearly the biggest weak spot on the team. And, and, and as I've said several times now, the, the easiest and biggest upgrade that could be made would be offensive line. I, I think when I went back and, and finished, you'll hear it tomorrow, but recapping the second half of the game, it really just came down to Rodgers, Royce, Elton Jenkins and John Runyon. Those four guys, and it, they're all offense. It was nobody on defense had a ton of uh, of bad stuff happen. I forget who was top on defense. It was, I think, like Quay and one other guy had like four maybe mistakes or, or times where a play was negative specifically because of them. But yeah, you, you've got... Let me just pull it up here real quick so I can see it. Yeah, so you've got... Uh, A.J. Dillon and Quay Walker are at four, right? John Runyon is at five plays. And again, remember, when you get checked for this, that means the play didn't work specifically because of you. Five plays failed because of John Runyon. Seven plays failed because specifically of Elton Jenkins. Eight plays failed. You don't even run that many plays. Think of it. (laughs) Eight plays failed specifically because of Royce Newman and 11 plays failed because of Aaron Rodgers. Now, the 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 positive and negative are going to skew toward Aaron Rodgers because he's the one throwing the ball the most. He also had the most positive plays with 13. But, you know, I would hope that the quarterback, especially the highest-paid quarterback in football, has a better ratio than 13 plays that succeeded because of Rodgers and 11 plays failed because of Rodgers. You know, it would be better if it was something like 20 and 5, you know, a couple errant passes, maybe a bad decision in there. 11 times that that kind of sucks by the way basically the Kenny Clark is is by far the the best I mean non-quarterback he was by far the best player on this team almost double the guy after him Robert Tunyon had six Kenny Clark 11 and Aaron Rodgers 13 11 plays that succeeded because of Kenny you remove him from the if he gets hurt and I'm sorry I'm even putting that into the universe this defense is done I have lost all hope in our defense if Kenny Clark goes away. Imagine 11 more times in this game we get gashed. And it probably would have been more than that because they would have been, instead of going off the field, they end up getting first downs and then there's more plays and there's more problems. 11 times by himself. Well, maybe not entirely by himself. Sometimes it's him and another guy, but 11 times that without him, I don't know if the play succeeds. That's crazy. Rashawn had five. Maybe maybe it's just because he's on the inside. I don't, I don't really know, but that dude is nuts. I'm excited to do this more in the future, especially keeping track of it, just to kind of see how this plays out. But anyways, yeah, the, the offensive line, um, Royce, Elton, Runyon, those three guys, if, if they play better, everything changes. Plus, not to mention Aaron Rodgers probably is playing better too if the offensive line does a better job. Um, so it, it's it's simple. We just got to do it. Anyways, patreon.com forward slash bash underscore daddy. If you want to support uh, the podcast, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. You can support at fertilegroundranch.org or you can find the link pinned to the top of my Twitter. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. 
Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, Ryan. Hey. You go. What up? Driving to work this morning, listening to last night's After Dark little pod. I, yeah. uh, I, I was going to listen to it last night, but I got, I got caught stuck watching an actual football game. Uh, and then I kind of fell asleep. But, uh, but clearly there is something going wrong with the Packer verse, you know, Packer multiverse, because we got, we got seemingly qualified and, you know, exceptional players playing like trash. Uh, we got you missing office quotes. So I don't know. Something, <laughs> something's going on. Something's in the air. I still want to know what the quote was uh, that I missed. I know. I, I tend to take a lighter side of stuff because that's how I cope. When the world is crashing around me, I tease the things that are about to squish me. So that's what I do. <laughs> uh, I know everybody has a different way to cope, and that's just how I do it. Some people drink. Some people, uh, you know, do very harmful things to their self. But I just tease stuff. So this, I will say this. Um, you know, I would say I've been a fan for a long time. But not really even just factors, but of football. And it's true. So I've seen everything. I've seen teams like this turn junk around and be good. And that could happen. Sure, it could happen. And they could also even get worse. But I will say this. Uh, if the whole punch them till they give up comment or drag them out in the deep end and let them drown, if that comment that was said does not make the players, like, kick the coaches out of the room and gather around together in a campfire and say, we got to fix this crap right now. If that doesn't make them explode and want to show the world how good they are, if that doesn't work, like if they come out and just bleh, against the commandos, then maybe this team is lost. I don't know. That is a good point. And, and I'll tell you what, you, we talk about Matt LaFleur and leadership. If that quote, if that video wasn't played in front of the whole team, that right there is a massive failure. That clip needed to be played for everybody to see. You don't hide your team from that. You put it out there and say, guess what? You want to know why we lost? Because they made a bet. They made a bet and said, I bet if we punch them in the mouth long enough, they'll quit. And we did. And like you said, you, you've got two ways of handling that. You can curl up in a ball into the fetal position and, and fall off. Or you can rise to the occasion, say, F you. Never in my life will anybody say that about me ever again. We're not going to be that team. Because right now, we're that team. We're the team where you just got to hang on because they'll quit eventually. They don't care. They don't have any heart. There's no passion here. They're a passionless team. That's crazy. And he, and he was right, and by a wide margin. They went into halftime tied, and that's when he told them that. Just hang on, and they'll drown. And we lost by three scores. He was very right. Maybe, uh, maybe this time for just a reboot. I don't know that sounds emotional, you know, Bears and Lions fans be like, man, we do this every year. And it's true. Um, but hey, we're the Green Bay Packers, dog. We don't, you know, we win. Uh, right. Y'all, y'all's organizations are okay with, you know, six wins a year. We're not. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see uh, how this team responds to getting punched in the face and sort of 
post and prodded and teased. And, you know, the coach is mad they're going to score again, man. That should piss. And that should number 53 on the team. He should be just stewing and ready to blow something up. So if they don't come out with fire against the commanders, ha, stick a fork in the Packers. Yeah, I mean, well, that, I'm out. So that is. All right. What, what did you say about my sister? <laughs> um, anyways, that that is the ultimate test for this team is the commanders. I don't think there is a, a better one. There may be other ones as the season rolls on, but this is the ultimate test. There's no more backing up. There is no more ground to give up. There, there you know. Again, there's there's a whole group of of positive fans that are hanging on to a couple things. They've got a couple things left in their back pocket to try to make it sound like everybody else is overreacting and being stupid. But there's not many left. And if you guys lose or or almost lose even to the Commanders, if it's even close, there's nothing left. There is nothing left. There might be one or two stragglers saying, "Oh, you can't even celebrate a win." That's going to be the best of it. But there's nothing. Everybody else is going to jump ship, and I promise you. If, uh, and I don't mean, you know, renounce their fandom, but I, I just mean in terms of support and believing in the team, there's no more believing, you know, there might be some empty words, but everybody's going to pretty much know what the situation is. And, and, and if we're actually talking about a loss, it is officially, officially over. There is, there's no saving this. So th- this is, this is low hanging fruit, right? Okay, fine. The jets are better than we thought. The giants are better than we thought. We're clearly worse than we thought, but at least they're semi-competent teams that we lost to. Plus, we traveled to London, which is tough. There's really no excuse against the Jets because I don't think they're as good as the Giants, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's also at home and after a loss and all that. But again, we've already conceded that we're a worse team than normal. But um, Washington is not that. They're not. So, yeah, you you need to win. And by a hefty margin, I would say, is what needs to happen. Hey, Ryan, this is Garrett. Hey. I just wanted to maybe address one of the things that's uh, been bothering me maybe the most over the last few weeks is is how the, you know, the amount we're paying Rodgers, uh, the amount that we're paying some of these guys and the production we're getting out of these guys is starting to wear on me, being blue collar. Uh, I know they're pro athletes. They get paid what they get paid. But, uh, man, I'm, I'm about ready to go back to that old, uh, idea that the XFL had a few years back where the winning team gets paid, the losing team gets nothing. Cause I'm getting tired of watching players who, like we've heard you say, and I've said this too several times, uh, I'm tired of watching guys who don't seem like they're playing like they don't care anymore. That is an interesting concept. I'm, I'm not saying I support it, but let's just let's play with that idea for a little bit. Imagine and let's keep the salaries at what they're at. Let's just say per game, some of these guys are getting millions of dollars. You know, there's there is one million dollars on the line per game. But let's just say for an average or something. I don't know. I'm sure it's quite less than that. But how much more effort would you see if you were either going to make a million dollars or zero dollars? How much more effort? How much more effort would these guys put in? The guys that go home, play video games, go out to the bar, go out and, you know, on dates with their fiance, girlfriend, whatever. How much more time would there be toward, I have to do this. I have to put in the work because I cannot stand to lose another game. I think the NFL would be much more exciting because you would see a lot more effort, probably a lot more fights and everything else too, because this is your livelihood on the line. But that's the point. You don't play like your livelihood's on the line. You know why it's not? Because it's not. Your livelihood isn't on the line. You already got paid. A lot of this is guaranteed. You're not going to lose any money for playing like garbage. In the long run, you probably will. Um, But that's when you see some guys, they play like gangbusters in their contract years. They end up making money, and then they regress once again. It would be nice if there was something to that effect, some kind of an incentive-based thing. You know, Um, I like incentive-based contracts in general. Just because you want, I mean, it's it's the players that don't want incentive based contract for obvious reasons. I don't want to. I, I don't think I should have to um, actually live up to what you're paying me in order to get paid. I don't think teams would ever mind an incentive based contract. 
Because even guys like Preston, who made a bunch more money because of how good he was, who's mad about that? You think the team's mad about that? I wish every contract was incentive-based. We don't even need to do the whole, either you get paid or you don't, but we, every contract should be incentive-based based on whatever. You know, you get a bonus if you get a sack. How much you want to bet where there's going to be more sacks in a season for a team in which every pass rusher has a sack incentive compared to a team that doesn't have a sack incentive? I don't know. Whatever. Again, I dream. Uh, but yet they're getting paid. So I know with my job, uh, I give 100%. And I'm getting tired of watching guys get paid amounts of money that I won't make in my entire lifetime in one year and just go out there and just lay an egg. Uh, it is getting old, and uh, I just wish these guys would have a dose of reality just for once where it wasn't reporters asking them questions, but it was actual fans and listening to the agony, the frustration, uh, the sheer just um, – there's no words to describe just what I'm feeling right now. I know we're spoiled in some respects. But come on, even I can recognize that guys are just not not stepping up the way they should. They're just something totally out of sync with this team. It just it's just just unbelievable. That's all I had to say, Ryan. Have a good one. Yeah, man, it's weird. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what the deal is. Um, again, I mean, you, 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 we all do, but we don't. You know, it's like, well, the offensive line isn't blocking well, and it's like, yeah. But really? Well, Devontae left too. I mean, the receivers are still pretty much getting open, but that's going to hurt a little bit. Well, okay. I don't, I don't know. Well, Rodgers is kind of struggling, probably because of the offensive line. So there's that little... It, it's, it seems like it's a bunch of little stuff, but it's way too big to be little stuff. So I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm just, I, I'm just trying to sit and watch and enjoy the ride, I guess. I'm not really sure. Hey, Ryan, this is Trevor in Virginia. Um, I'm not caught up on the podcast yet. I couldn't listen for a couple of days. You know, I get it. Team looks bad. I mean, my the biggest disappointment, I think, is the offensive line. I think, uh, I don't know. I'm just a little too much negativity, and I'm not Mr. Positive all the time or anything. But, I mean, the defense is getting so much hatred. But from, my, from what I see, they're averaging 20 and a half points let up a game, which. Yeah, I. I... Well, I'll, I'll let you figure your point, and then I'll jump on it. That in itself should be enough to hold us the victory, but you you combine that with I'm pretty sure every week there's been a touchdown that's been either a pick six or special right. teams gaff, or, you know, we give it to the other team in scoring range already. I, I, I'd be comfortable taking seven points off that a week where our defense is letting up 13 and a half points a week. I mean, I, 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 I don't see where they're really – and I get it. It looks doesn't look the best on the field, but as numbers-wise, I – I don't think they're doing terrible. Um, and then, I mean, we were 13-win team three years in a row. The first team to ever win 13 three years in a row. I mean, the dominant Patriots, all these dominant Dynasty 49ers of the past, never did it four times in a row. I mean, it was a pipe dream. We thought we were going to be the first team to do it three times and then come out and do it four times. But um, I just also think, you know, it's, it's October, and people act like the season's over. All right, I'm going to stop you there because you're past the first part. I agree with the defense. I don't understand. I mean, things are bad enough as it is, and I don't know if it's just when people get angry, they want to be angry at everything and everyone. Um, I don't really understand it. I I, I think the defense is doing a good job. They're certainly not perfect, but, I mean, scoring, allowing zero points a game is not really an option. And again, as I've said in the past, although this year is weird, 24 points is pretty standard. So we're talking three touchdowns and a field goal given up in a game, and you look at that defensive performance and go, meh, that's pretty standard. I don't know if the Packers have really done that all year. Again, they gave up 27 points, but seven was special teams, so they gave up, what, 20? And then if you subtract anything starting at, like, the, what, the 45-ish yard line, you kind of take a little bit off of that, maybe maybe 50. I don't know where it's kind of like, yeah. But the the Packers actually came up with a bunch of stops in that territory. So I know it's it's discouraging, but yeah, the, the, the hatred toward the defense, and I think maybe it's just because of the expectation was that they're going to be elite, which I don't even know if, what, what, what did elite mean to you at the time 10 points a game or something because that's not a thing if you're talking 15 16 17 points a game they're not too far off from that especially again if you don't look at the pick sixes and the special team stuff 
So it it might not be where we want it to be, but I think it's I think it's solid. And I just wonder if the offense was really doing a good job if we'd even care. You know, if the defense scored 30 points a game every game and we won all these games and the defense is allowing 15, 16, 17, we're saying this is an elite offense and defense, but because we're only scoring 10 and our defense has given up 20, now it's like oh, our defense freaking sucks. They 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 could have stopped them and they didn't. Uh, no. It's the same with special teams. Again, it, Worst special teams. I can't believe it. We thought it was going to be better, and it's not. No, it's it's significantly better than it was. Again, it's it was two players on two plays out of hundreds of player plays. And just because the result is catastrophic doesn't mean the entire unit is a disaster. Almost everybody is doing a pretty solid job. Solid to great. And most of them are the guys that we brought in. Massive upgrades. And now, on top of that, we might even have a kick returner. He only did one, but again, I haven't seen that in front. Nobody wants to talk about it because everybody's so angry and everybody says the special team sucks and the defense sucks. And again, you go back and look at it and it's like, no, it's like, it's the offense and it's primarily like four guys that are causing us problems on offense. The defense collapsed in the end because, well, the, first of all, because it happens eventually. Very, I, I don't think, <laughs> how do teams score touchdowns without the defense failing? So you're not going to watch a defense, including like the Buffalo Bills, in which like teams just can't move against them. Like there's no first downs, there's no scores, there's no field goals, there's certainly no touchdowns. They're the number one defense. How could they ever do that? No, teams do do that. They drive down the field, they score points. Even bad teams will score points against them. So I, I guess the point is there's enough to be angry about without making up stuff to be angry about. You know what I mean? Let's focus on the things that are actually bad and, and not worry about complaining about things that aren't actually that bad. You know, there's a lot to fix and there's no guarantee it gets fixed, but... Um, it just seems to me like there's a few plays a game that we're not making. You know, the blocks, talk, block punt and field goal like you talked about. The turnovers are, you know, unusual, especially some of them are just like, what the hell happened? Like that one with the handoff this week. Um, and- it's the second time that's happened. I, I think, and I appreciate you trying to be positive, but the problem is it's almost every play. It's almost every play somebody's not doing their job. It's it's on top of that it's turnovers on top of that it's it's lack of execution and not knowing what they're doing and then it's things like like you said one of the turnovers was on handoff which should never happen it's so basic and stupid and we've done it twice now so it is a it's a much bigger issue than like one play here and there you know like we're we're so close to winning but there was that one fluky play where the ball just bounced the wrong way kind of thing that's not the situation we're in this this is this is a serious systemic issue from top to bottom, left to right, pretty much on a play-to-play basis, with the exception of the defense kind of giving us a solid half to three quarters and special teams being good until that one massive play that kind of just ruins the whole game forever. Yeah, last week against the Giants where the punt hit the guy and we couldn't even dive on it without it squirting out of bounds. It's just, right. we need these plays, need to start making them go our way. And I think, you know, we have a lot of different outcomes, but... You know, on top of that, I think people will just have this misconception. You need 13, 14, 15 wins to be a team that's a Super Bowl contender. But you look since 2000, 16 of the 22 winners had 12 wins or less. I mean, it's you don't have to be this dominant team all year wrong, long. You gotta, you gotta get it going late in the season when it counts. I mean, uh, so I don't know. I just t- I would say you'd need at least 10, bare minimum, to be a a an actual contender. And in order to get to 10, you got to have more wins than losses, and we don't right now. So we have to be better than, than we are, right? I mean, that's, I know you're not saying otherwise, but we certainly need to be better than this, and, and significantly so. Because if we can't beat the teams that we've already lost to, then we don't really stand a chance against the rest of the schedule slash certainly any team that we would meet in the playoffs. You can, like you've always said, if you're playing, if you're watching football just for the Super Bowl, also, you know what's what's the point? Because you're gonna be you're gonna be sad a lot. So, you know, it's just all the negativity is kind of sucking the joy out of it for me. And I mean, I'm I'm one that gets mad when we lose and all, but you know, I think should have a little hope and a little faith that the team might turn it around. And not not at all saying that I expect them to or that it's a guarantee, but you know, it, it's also not a guarantee that they won't figure it out come uh, November, December. So, love the pod, keep it going. Yeah, I think I have a hard time with that. It it's just it just kind of depends on the the type of person that you are. And I and I'm sure most podcasters are not, you know, you got Matt Ramage and like nobody. 
right? He's the only guy that has a positive spin on everything. And, and Clayton's pretty positive too, I guess. But I think from my perspective, and I'm guessing most podcasters and people that do this, it's, it's analytical. I just had somebody complain on Twitter. I posted the, the stat that I had mentioned to you, and they, they said something to the effect of, I'm so sick of every time somebody says something about the Packers, it's negative. And I didn't say anything, but my first thought was, I wonder if that has any correlation to the play on the field being negative. In other words, it's probably going to be more positive when they're playing positive and negative when they're going to be negative because it's reality. And that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be negative for the sake of being negative. I'm not making a life choice like, hey, you know what? In 2022, I think I'm just going to be negative toward the team. I'm simply saying what is. And again, you'll hear me say, but that can change. I'll give it time. But I can't fill an hour of, you know, maybe it'll be okay. I can't elaborate because there's nothing positive. right? There's, There's literally no stats. There's no data. There's nothing. There's no film reviews, film studies. There's nothing that I can look at that would indicate that we're on a positive path and are headed in a positive direction. But I'm going to state that, and then we're going to have radio silence for 45 minutes. That's, you know, I understand wanting to shut it down because you don't want to hear it anymore. And in your mind, it's all I need to know is we might be able to turn it around. I don't want to hear anything else. But you really can't fill too much time with just maybe the future won't be like it is today. Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, now that we know that. And there's also an issue of, in, of integrity because this is, this is not the way I would handle any other team. I mean, I can try to skew data and I can try to find little tidbits here and there and it'll get all kinds of likes and it'll get all kinds of retweets and everybody will say, see, see, here's the positive and here, but I'm, but I'm lying. And how many times have you heard me rant and rave on this podcast about people that twist stats to try to make it look like something that it's not trying to make these, these free agent acquisitions look like studs. And really they're not by using weird stats, like, you know, most pressures from 2014, 2015, 2019, 2021 on third down and four or greater like why did you skip years and what the heck is third down and four or greater what does that even mean i hate that because it's dishonest if you want to look at things you look at it honestly and you say all the best available information i didn't pull up that stat just because it's negative i went to go find all i want to know is what 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 is most likely i'm not asking the question what's more likely that's positive i just want to know where are we and where are we likely to head based on historic data and if you don't like the, I'm not talking about you, Trevor, I'm just saying in general, if you don't like it, this isn't going to be the show for you. And again, believe me, I'm not ranting and raving just for the sake of it. I don't want this to be negative either. I want the team to be good, but I'm not going to say positive things just because it'll make people feel better. Maybe I should because there's certainly a market for it. I mean, there, you'll also get called a bootlicker by all the negative fans and everything else, and probably rightly so, but there's always that balance. But that's why I just go down the middle. You're going to have one group that always says you're too negative, one group that says you're too positive. When when good things happen and you say it's good, you're a bootlicker. When bad things happen and you say it's bad, you're not a true fan. How about I'm just going to say what it is, and that's it, and I'm just going to keep saying what it is, and I'm going to keep trying to theorize what I think is happening and what might be happening and what's most likely to happen. And yeah, when you're a bad football team, the outlook is not bright. Aside from maybe things will change, because it might, fine. But that's not necessarily most likely to happen. You know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, there is a clear path for the Packers to be a better football team. And it starts with the offensive line. I'm worried about the culture aspect of it. I'm worried about the drive. I'm worried about the passion, because if you're only given 75%, it's not really going to matter. But start with the offensive line. Let's get that short up. Maybe make a change, kick in Elton, put Yash out there. I don't really know, but get that figured out. Maybe comp- maybe like Roger said, simplify it, compress the playbook a little bit so there's not as much rattling around in guys' heads because they can't hold all that in there. I've had probably way too many StarCraft analogies, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just starting to try to learn how to play the game properly. And so it's very, very precise. If you want to be good at it, it's, it's at this minute mark you do, or it's supply mark, but at this point you do this and you do exactly this and then you do this and and it's down to a T it's precision and it's funny because if you watch me it's pathetic to watch me and it's like how did you miss that one simple thing how could you po- it's the simplest thing you click here and you click there and you set it and you're done how hard is that we've done this a hundred times and you can't get it through your stupid head 
but it's not the one thing. It's all the stuff going on in my head. There's so many things I'm trying to think of. And then half the time my brain just goes blank because there's too much going on and I can't process. And it's like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm lost. So I'm like pausing the game because I'm just going against AI because I don't even want to bother going against real people. I've done that. It's a disaster. Plus, they're so unpredictable. They're rushing me. And it's like, get out of here. I haven't practiced for that yet. I'm just trying to learn how to get through a build order here. But that's that's the point. It's easy to understand how you can mess up a simple thing if your brain is trying to process too much at once. You can't do anything. You're, you're, you're focused on too much and not the simple thing that's right in front of you. So again, I, I can see a path. But there's still several steps. Is that even a a true path that's going to fix anything? Do we even have the talent? Maybe there is a talent issue here on this team. Maybe these guys genuinely did just fall off. Are they actually going to follow the path? Are they going to follow it in the right way? You know, there's, there's a million little tiny steps that all have to fall in place for this to be a thing. And then it's a question of, okay, the offensive line's better. How much does that actually improve things? Does Rodgers actually really improve as a result of the offensive line improving? Or maybe does he just have some deficiencies on his own despite the offensive line? Same thing with the run game. Same thing with the wide receivers. Maybe now that Rodgers has time, there's nowhere to throw the ball. What difference does it make? That's sort of the, my, my bigger issue. The, the smaller issue, you look at it and say, yeah, they can turn it around. They've got the talent. The bigger issue is there's so many little things, and each little thing requires a lot to go exactly right for it to work. So I don't know. But again, you take on too much at once, and... um you kind of just get overwhelmed with it. That's true of the players as well as the fans and the podcasters. So I'm trying to find a balance between, you know, saying this is what it is, this is what it might be, this is what it could be, should be, and also like, I don't know, man, let's just let's just kick back and see how it goes. Um, I think the, the could be, should be is winning a little bit when you start talking about firing the head coach and promoting a new guy as head coach. We're kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, you could say. But um, it's uncharted territory, and I think a lot of us don't necessarily know how to navigate this the best. I think that's fair to say. Anyways, I am going to leave it at that. Trevor did have one more call, but we're we're buttoning up against an hour here, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Trevor, we'll start off with you tomorrow. Please get your calls in, 608-501-0718. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.